Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Plains on the Prairie podcast. I'm Max. And I'm Sam. And today we are rounding out our known North Dakota aces. Uh, this one, I, I think we saved a really interesting one for, for the last one. Oh, for sure. And, and you know, our last ace is not a World War II ace. Right? I know. It's yeah. A little bit of a change. And, you know, that's something I was looking around and we don't like looking at other aces in other states. They're mostly World War II to our recollection, you know, mm-hmm. it's just kind of going to be really cool here. Yeah, so. absolutely. So today's ace is World War I fighter ace, John Owen Donaldson. Um, if you're ready, Sam, I think we should just hop right in. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so John Donaldson was born on May 14th, 1897 at Fort Yates, North Dakota. Um, so during that time, it probably would have been, a, you know, basically a frontier oh, yeah. base. Um, down there. And his father was the commander of Fort Yates, uh, U.S. Army General Thomas Donaldson Jr. Um, When he was still very young, John and his family relocated to Greenville, South Carolina, where he um, basically spent his entire boyhood. He uh, attended Greenville High School and then nearby um, Furnham uh, University and then Cornell University. However, uh, during that time, World War I was raging over in Europe. Uh, so he left Cornell early and joined the Royal Flying Corps in Canada. And so, Sam, something that we were talking about before the episode, um, I know during the Second World War, you had the RCAF, or the Royal Canadian Air Force. Um, but when he joined the Royal Flying Corps in Canada, it was still encompassed under the, the British, basically. Yeah, basically right? it was a Commonwealth conglomerate, eventually, essentially. But, but so, yeah. so let's say, you know, or... You know, maybe if he hadn't gone to Canada, like, and for whatever reason, he traveled thousands of miles to South Africa, he would have been in the same situation. In the same boat, essentially, yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. <clears throat> so, uh, he joined the Royal Flying Corps in March of 1917, what, just a month before yeah. the United <laughs> States entered the war? Um, so, when the U.S. entered the war, he was transferred uh, to the Air Service U.S. Army, but attached to the Royal Air Force, or the RAF, uh, not long after, specifically number 32 squadron. So I, again, we were talking before the episode, and I, I think it, it's one of those things that we've heard of with exchange pilots. I think John Glenn was an exchange pilot yeah. with the, from the Marines to the Air Force in the Korean War, but I can't Im- imagine it was very common to see an American be transferred to a British unit, especially now that the Americans were in the war. Right. Well, and with the, the nature of World War One, the U.S. stayed out of it as long as possible. That's kind of our, our stance with both wars. Yeah. Um, stay out of it until it becomes an American problem. <laughs> um, you know, you know how all World War One started or for the U.S., the Zimmerman telegram, all, you know, all the little baiting throughout right. the whole yeah. first three years. <laughs> um, but basically, we had a lot of pilots that had foresight or just wanted to get involved. We had the uh, Lafayette Escadrille with the mm-hmm. French. A lot of pilots did join the Royal Flying Corps early. And the U.S. kind of turned a blind eye to that. There wasn't really anything put in place. Whereas, uh, like, during World War II, you had a massive penalty for being a, a member of a belligerent nation that wasn't the U.S. Really? Uh, yeah. But the U.S. also looked a blind eye to, like, the Eagle Squadron pilots and say, stuff. Yeah. Like, that's why we got a couple in our you know, tri-state area from that. But, um, but yeah, basically he was attached. It, it wasn't uncommon. And a lot of our most experienced American pilots had previous experience with, you know, we didn't have an air force really. Right. Um, it was the army air service, I guess, but it still was borrowed aircraft. Like we got a model hanging here and then uh, right above the office here in Newport 28. Mm-hmm. That's in American colors. That's a French airplane. Mm-hmm. So there was, yeah, we didn't really have any American grown fighter aircraft at that point. <clears throat> so within two months of being posted to number 32 squadron um, in early July of 1918, he managed to shoot down a staggering eight German planes. And Sam, I know you know a lot more about uh, World War One aviation than I do. And you found more actual, the nitty gritty of those kills. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So all of his kills came within just over a month, which that's pretty insane. You know, the life expectancy for a pilot was four to eight weeks generally as in in world war one it was a kill or be killed type of nature there was a lot of chivalry and stuff involved too but a lot of his kills to my they were actually kills not just victories you know so uh you know the, it was just a different world compared to world war ii flying Absolutely. uh your aircraft 
was canvas. It was wood framed. Your guns jammed half the time. <laughs> your engine was suspect at best. And you're going up there, freezing your butt off in an open cockpit. And yeah, it's just insane what they did. And, you know, you caught on fire. You were given three options. Jump, try to land it. Or the third, you did yourself in. Yeah. Yep, you had a service pistol required for that reason. It wasn't really to defend yourself on right. the ground. It was, yes. do you want an easier way out? Yep. So unfortunate, but it, it did happen That's a the lot. Nature of, and, I mean, to you know, bring up a Hollywood movie, I assume you've seen Fly Boys. I grew up watching that movie. Um, I think as you know, inaccurate as some scenes may be, I think it shed a perfect light on you know the brutalness of yeah, World there's War. There's a lot of humanity in war. Yep. And, oh, that's that's something you know us nerds get. We, we, at least we can see past a little bit of the inaccuracies. Mm-hmm. Every movie kind of has one. Of so, course, yeah. But but yeah, it's the humanity of war, and they cover those really well. But um, yeah, the nature of World War One flying combat was a lot of. Um, staying ahead of the curve it things were it was the first true 100 percent land sea and air war yeah absolutely. um you had aerial combat pre in previous wars you know little localized conflicts in the balkans and you know little t- pistol duels basically with say, curtis it, pushers it, yeah and, yeah it's not really not really counting i guess mm-hmm. i mean the the aircraft at the beginning of world war one the doctrine was they're used for scouting their army cooperation aircraft you go, you go and look and, and observe enemy lines. They weren't armed. You had a pistol, maybe. Yeah. But they weren't armed. And so. but that was when you would have the scout pilots from belligerent nations sh- shooting at each. Yeah, other. they started bringing ser- their service using their service pistols yeah. or trying to figure out ways to mount the the gun. We can go on a huge tangent here about how uh, aircraft synchronization gear works. Uh, you know armored propellers all that but anyways all that aside by this point it was all figured out and the doctrine changed fighters were used to get at other fighters get at bombers bombers were used you know to to take out entrenchment positions yeah london yeah yeah, strategic yeah the the zeppelins and um but by this point everything was still being figured out but it was all about which it was about the pilot just as much as the airplane Mm -hmm. uh, because you were learning new tactics and there was no thatch weave there was no you know you turn it as you yeah. went, basically. Yeah, basically had the moment turn and stuff from there. But um yeah, his first victory, anyways, to get off that <laughs> tangent of, uh came on July 22nd, 1918. All these will be 1918. Uh he shot down a Fokker, probably a D7 at this point. That's kind of what I was surmising. It was always called Fokker biplane. Mm-hmm. So assume all of the Fokker when I say that will be a D7. And then uh he got another one on the 25th. Then on the 8th of August, he got a scout plane. Uh, not really sure which kind. They weren't very descriptive. Could have been a Hansa Brandenburg D1. Could be a bunch. Mm-hmm. There's a lot There's of scout lot. planes. Yep. Uh, August 9th, he got uh, another scout plane. That was, there was three of them, actually, that were attacking presumably another British scout plane. They wouldn't, you know, most pilots, if they had any sense back then, it was the tactic of you know don't enter a fight you can't win yeah, and, yeah like well you've probably seen the movie red baron and yep. that that set in there like seven <laughs> times and um but yeah that was a true tactic and then um he on the 25th got another fokker d7 the 29th his um his last victory was a uh was another fokker and that's a total of eight so wow. really impressive yeah, um, almost a double ace in world war one almost yeah and uh you know thinking about it you know the the most was 80 from rick Telfin yeah. and yeah really so so during my research i found that he had driven a few into either the ground or just broke them up yeah so i was kind of reading that too sent them spiraling down or sent them out of control yeah i'm guessing that's the equivalent of a probable so he could have easily shot down gotcha. more but, I didn't know if he was doing some acrobatics and the yeah. pilots were like, what? And well, and spun out. there wasn't really a confirmed, you know, the scoring system of damage probable, confirmed, shared, all yeah. that stuff really wasn't set at this if point. If you shot it down yeah. or if it trailed black smoke. Yeah, I mean, they'd right? had tally boards. You've seen that in movies, yep. too. Yep. I mean, we're referencing a lot of movies here, but but um, there's tally boards of victories, and that was actually a thing. Cool. So. Cool. 
So yeah, uh, on September 1st, 1918, he was shot down in aerial combat by another ace, this time on the Germans, um, Lieutenant Theodore Quant, if I'm pronouncing it, Quant, Quaint, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, who was assigned to Jagstaffel 53 or Yasta 53. Um, I just, I love how they say the old World War I German oh, squadron. Yeah. It's just, it sounds sinister. Uh, so from there, um, oh, let's see here, I have notes. Um, he was immediately captured on the ground by German infantry, and uh, the next day, he and a companion uh, managed to escape. I believe they must have been at an aerodrome, because it said that he tried to steal a two-seater, um, and in the ensuing scuffle, uh, was actually bayoneted by one of the German sentries. So, I don't know about you, but I would have loved to have been the, a fly on the side of that. Oh, yeah, plane that would have been really... go down. <laughs> yeah. Um, miraculously, even despite being bayoneted, he and the companion must have escaped into the woods or something because they got away and they were on the run until September 9th when they were caught trying to, I think, swim across a stream in no man's land. Yeah. And again, uh, recaptured and sent back to, um, uh, to internment. However, uh, just another couple days later, almost out of the three stooges, they escaped again. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't know what security was like in 1918. But I'm just surprised he didn't get shot at or anything. Like, I mean, the bayoneting, not surprising, but it's just but at, at on a second time. time. You got to think, if you get bayoneted in World War One, you're already hurt. And now you're in no man's land, which is... Well, and the, you know how the field hospitals were back then. Yeah. And, well, in the conditions, this, well, if you said a, a trench stream, uh, that's what it's I'm probably saying. nasty. If you're swimming <laughs> in no man land water... That is disgusting. And if you have an open wound, I'm I'm surprised he made it that far. Yeah. That's that's remarkable. Much worse than Flint water too. Yeah. So. <laughs> but yeah, he uh he and um the same companion and then three other POWs managed to escape German captivity and uh, work their way to the neutral Netherlands, which I actually did not know was neutral during World War 1. Mm -hmm. Um in October before the war ended. So uh, he finished the war, I believe, as a captain in the Air Service U.S. Army. And in October of 1919, while still in the U.S. or the Air Service, um, participated and won the U.S. Uh, Transcontinental Air Race. Um, and he was awarded the McKay Gold Medal for that. So, you know, pretty, pretty big deal for oh, yeah. especially, you know, before 1920. That's that's huge. Well, and transcontinental flights weren't well. Getting off on a tangent here. Have you heard of Vinfiz? I have not. So it was a is a right model B. So the a little bit of a more advanced, if we want to say that, yeah. a version of the right flyer. And again, the Vinfiz Soda Company is a guy. He uh, was sponsored by them, and he did the first transcontinental flight across the U.S. He had a a train follow him with parts. He crashed dozens of times <laughs> and and made it all the way across California. And unfortunately, I mean he he crashed and died about like 200 yards from where he actually finished his flight actually, but yeah that that happened in 1911 so not very long yet you know yeah for real and aircraft didn't have the range so he did multiple stops on this of course but but pretty insane that is a, yeah for yeah 1919 and to think the right flyers flew what 16 years before 1903 yeah. a lot happened yeah absolutely so uh, in March of 1920 uh, then Captain Donaldson was given command of the 94th Aerial Squadron um, after the previous squadron commanding officer, uh, Captain Field E. Kidley was killed in a crash. Um, like you just mentioned in your previous, you know, statement, it seemed like aircraft crashes were the number one killer of. of yeah, it was planes. kind of a learn as you go with safety measures. And yeah, thankfully, now we have a lot of those safety measures. Otherwise, I don't know if I'd be sitting here. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh Strangely, uh, Captain Donaldson resigned his commission from the Air Service in, I believe, the early 1920s, um, and he went on to work for or become a pretty serious air racer and also the president of the Newark Air Service in New Jersey. So um, get in on the ground floor of oh, yeah. an airline, especially in the 1920s, as air travel is really starting to, you know. Yeah, it was a risky endeavor absolutely. at the same time because it's it flying back then was not for not for the, uh, the, 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 the middle class or yeah. And just, yeah, it's, it's a risky thing. Yeah, so absolutely. yeah. 
so he continued throughout the 1920s as, uh, you know, it seemed like a stunt pilot, an air racer, just, you know, one of those. Like, Do it all. Yep, basically. Yeah. And on September 7th, 1930, um, Donaldson was flying a uh, travel air whirlwind. If I believe, I, I know you probably know more about that airplane than I do. Um, at the American Legion air race in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and he'd actually just won the race and was performing some stunt maneuvers, uh, you know, just aerobatics for yeah. the crowd and something went wrong and his plane went down and, uh, crash into the ground according to eyewitnesses it telescoped when it hit the ground so mm. i would assume that that's the aircraft just yeah basically like an accordion yeah. compressing yeah. and uh miraculously donaldson survived the initial crash but was very very injured in the uh the wreck and uh passed away at a nearby hospital from his injuries um he is buried in winds oh, wow Excuse me. Westview Cemetery in Atlanta, Georgia. So, um, you know, not, I think he was what, 30 years old when he passed away? Yeah, 33. 33. Yeah, so not too old. No, no. Not at all. But I, I think a very fitting, you know, a, a fitting end to our North Dakota Aces series and, you know, oh, yeah. interesting guy, even if he didn't spend that much time in North Dakota. Right. We well, still have him by birthright. So yeah, we have him. It's kind of, yeah, we got a couple that barely qualify, you know, but they qualify. They qualify. Uh, so now we'll move into the squadron. Um, number 32 squadron of the RAF was formed on 12 January 1916 and first flew the Airco DH-2. Um, I saw a picture of one and it looked like something that Leonardo da Vinci would have drawn up. Yeah, and they're they're very kite-like. Um, <laughs> the the Airco aircraft were, you know, the, the thought of those was um, you didn't have... Synchronization gear was uh, first actually through the Germans, the... They they introduced it first with the uh, Fokker Eindecker. You you probably are aware of that the the monoplane. Yep. Yep. And that was what when the Fokker Scourge started. If you've heard of that term, where they just completely wrecked the the Royal Flying Corps really? and the French. They just <laughs> huge huge victories for them, huge losses for the the Allies. Um, and uh, you know you had uh, Roland Garros, the French ace with the armored prop at that point. But it was just the Airco was. Hey, we don't have to fire through a prop, yeah. So we're going to use this, and and the pusher technology was pretty popular back then too. So speaking on the the Fokker Scourge, as you said, um, how did these early pilots, especially German pilots, get to be so good? Was it just I, I assume because well, in World War Two, you know, the leading German aces almost exclusively got all their two hundred kills on the Eastern Front. Yeah, and you can argue. German Eastern Front kills and a lot of their early war successes were due to their high quality of pilots because a lot of them started pre-war. They were part of the hidden air force, you know, yeah. and um, but a lot of their victories are against very obsolescent aircraft. Uh, think about the going against the, the Poles who held their own really well for what they had. They had a PZL, P7, P11, P24, you know, just not very comparable to a 109. A lot of those type of aircraft, same with the Russians, Barbarossa, I-16s, I-153s, stuff that can't yeah. compete with a 109 gotcha. or even a 190 later, a little bit later. But um, the World War One German pilots, they, they were, yeah, that. they were they, just that. They were learning with, with everything. And, um, you know, you have the false sense of, or the false, you know, image of a pilot being an individual. Thankfully, you know, the air combat isn't that way, really. I mean, if it was that way, there'd be a lot higher death toll um, because, you know, you you hunted as a group. The Germans never were on their own on purpose. And it was all about tactic sharing. The Germans just did really well. You had some standouts. I mean, you had the heroes that stood out and they were public figures, mostly for pop uh, propaganda, like Max Immelman. And um, you got uh, Richthofen, yeah. Goring, Udet, all those, you know, high profile. The ones, know the ones everybody yeah. knows. Yeah. So it was it was very much a tactic share. Gotcha, gotcha. So number thirty two squadron would flew, uh, fly missions over the Western Front. I, I saw that they participated in the Battle of the Somme mm -hmm. and a few other of those really nasty campaigns. Yeah. Um, and eventually the DH twos were replaced by DH fives, and then um, the SE five As, which was what Donaldson was flying during the war. Um, at war's head, at, wow, excuse me. At war's end, um, they returned to the UK and were deactivated in December of 1919. I 
I, I believe they were reactivated interwar. They were, yes. Uh, flying Hawker Hurricanes. And yeah, they even got snipes oh, after really? they were reactivated, which is World War One era, you know, aircraft. So at 19, I think 1920 or 21 when they were reactivated. It was, yeah, so it was kind of, you know, still that transition period. Sam, I feel like you could do a five hour long episode on every interwar plane. I don't know if people would want to listen <laughs> to that, though. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, really interesting. And in, in the we'll get into the SC five, I suppose, in a little bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I know during the Second World War, they flew uh combat missions early on in some of the more lesser known campaigns. I think they were one of the squadrons that escorted uh ferry am I saying that ferry swordfish? They escorted them on their way to hit um some of those early war German battleships. I think the Prince Eugen, Prince Eugen uh, and yeah, the Scharnhorst. Scharnhorst. Yeah. And I think well, other, and I think that was a doomed mission from the start, basically. Yeah, and they were also stationed in North Africa following the torch landings. Mm-hmm. I saw with Spitfires. And then uh, I think finished out the war in Greece during mm-hmm. the Civil War there. So, yeah. Some lesser known conflicts for the RAF. And, and you know, I read about that. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I was up late. Yep. Um. So. Uh, today, I, I should mention, um, following World War II, they were converted into a training unit, or not training unit, um, transport unit, and today provide um, VIP transport for the RAF and I believe the royal family, because mm-hmm. they have royal in the, the title of the squadron. So whenever you see uh, Prince Henry or one of those guys, I don't know. Like I don't fall, I, yeah. We won a war in 1776 to not yep. care about it, so... Yeah, I think that that's we're, we're dudes. We don't follow yeah. it too hard. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they're still around today, and they fly um, a lot of VIP VIP planes. So. Yeah, they're basically Dassault Falcons, the three engine yeah. private jets that you see, you know, at, at the rich rich people side of the airport. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, really, really interesting, and another cool cool tidbit Absolutely. they're seeing that they're still around, you know, and for the fact they're flying around VIPs is pretty neat too. Yeah, very cool. But yeah, and then the. Uh, the aircraft he flew was the SC-5A primarily during his career. Uh, the SC-5, you know, was arguably the best aircraft the Allies put forth in all of the war. I would, I would say it's right up there with the, uh, uh, or most advanced, I should say, um, right up there with like the Spad 13. I was going to say, I know the Spad is usually the yeah. one that gets the fame. And they were uh, between the two British, the the Camel and and the SC-5A. The SC-5 was favored by almost every pilot. Really. Uh, the camel was really good once it was in the air. It was a bear to fly, though. It's what I was what I was reading. Very skittish, uh, mm-hmm. very hard to fly. And the SC five was the opposite. It was very no vi- not much for vices. You know, it just just did its job. Good. And yeah, it was super and, super cool looking too. Yeah, I was gonna say you look at an SC five, and they normally maybe it's a different plane, but they have a, a Lewis machine gun mounted on, on top. top. Yep, that's really that's interesting. Yeah. So did the pilots have to compensate for, you know, where if they were diving down on a target, they had to say, okay, you know, the machine gun is what? Yeah, three, you're not five, sighting, right? You're yeah. just you're just reaching, pulling that trigger. Oh, so, you're actually reaching. Yeah, up. some sometimes sometimes they had like a gotcha. They were mounted differently, but but yeah, they wow. they're actually one of the fastest aircraft of the war. Really? Uh, come to think of it, you know, like the DR one, the triplane, mm-hmm. one of the slower ones actually is. I mean, very maneuverable, very, but it, it didn't top out over 100 miles an hour. And the SC-5, if this is me, a shot in the dark, I didn't look up the specs of the aircraft. I think it had a top speed of about 120 something, which gotcha. is pretty fast for yeah, World War One. Era. War One, absolutely. And they were used all over the place. They were they were used, you know, in the in the Middle East conflicts during or in the Middle East uh, theater, you know, mm-hmm. against the Ottomans, and they're used all over the place. And yeah. and uh, they stayed on with squadrons for a while after the war i'm not sure how late the u.s used them mm-hmm. quite extensively as well because we were still figuring well, out our own fighter yeah, yeah the only indigenous fighter from that area era was probably the thomas morse scout you've probably heard yep. of that heard yep so so pretty interesting um and i didn't see there is one se5 in the at dayton oh in, really yeah is it's it an, original it is it's not in cool. it's not in the markings of of number 32 squadron there is none but it is i forget the guy's name but one one of the top aces is it an air service marked it, it it's RAF? it's raf mark he was attached to the raf it's marked up as this guy i think he had it was less than it was less than um uh, rickenbacker but 
with one of the top bases for the U.S. during gotcha. the war. Which, if you think about it, Rick, Rick and Bacher, you get you get twenty six kills, twenty seven high twenties huh? kills in in two years of involve less than two years of involvement. It's, or yeah, it was a little less than two because yeah. they joined April seventeenth, the war ended November eighteenth. So I just I I have to imagine like when you hear about these pilots shooting down um you know 26 planes in that amount of time or going back to our first day scrappy bloomer shooting down five and 15 minutes i i like are they just lining up in front like a carnival game it's it's something they that, must have paid them you know? yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um, it, it just it's one of those things that i i can't i've never been in that situation and no, i don't hope, hope, no, never, never hope we don't have to but it's like it's it, it's just it, it's you'll, you'll never see it again though yeah i mean yeah with i missiles. mean even the pilots won't see it again if they're the ones doing it because everything's beyond visual range exactly. at this point and it's it's a different time and it's it was really fun to research i mean i learned a lot doing yes, that episode i don't I know much too. about world war I, compared to world war ii so i i agree um i i think this series did a lot for me to really appreciate you know some of the guys that came before us mm-hmm. in you know World War II, World War One, and Donaldson's case. Um, it's you know it, it's been a rewarding experience, and um, if we do find any more North Dakota aces, we will include them um, in this series. But for the meantime, I think we are going to take a bit of a break uh, just with the holidays coming up, um, and then like Sam mentioned, this was this North Dakota aces series was a lot of research yeah i mean it's been about two and a half months of straight putting these out i mean we had a couple two week breaks in there but you know i was to research further yeah, on exactly. our episodes so um but we still will be putting out videos for you guys we actually have something exciting you know a couple things exciting coming up for yeah. you and we're really we're really pumped for those and more more of the video format but you know for now we're going to like like you said take a break and we'll figure out some more topics yep. and we'll probably shy away from a series for now. If we do any episodes mm-hmm. coming up before the end of the year, but they'll be, they'll be fun to research. Absolutely. regardless. They always so, are. Yeah. I, I, I love it. I, you know, I, I think I speak for both of us. If any of us didn't enjoy it, we wouldn't be doing the podcast. Right. So, yeah. Well with that, uh, thank you guys for giving this one a listen. Um, let us know if there's any topics that you want us to cover when we get back to doing, um, you know podcast episodes in a month or two but yeah for sure and then uh check out all the new uh thumbnails that max has made they're all they're all (laughs) at least on youtube they're all up and they're very eye-catching i mean um my my dad was here well for your mustang mania event here at the museum on tuesday my dad was commenting. He's like, Is that, "Are those the new thumbnails? Did you come out with new thumbnails?" And I was like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Did you make them?" Nope. <laughs> and he, he uh, they're eye catching. I mean, yeah. Uh, just seeing like even on our view counts, it goes up in yeah, our thumbnails. He, ooh, that looks cool. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you guys for tuning in, and have a great rest of your week. All right. See you guys. Thanks.